I've stepped into the ocean over and over again Out away from the shoreline to find you where the world ends I've looked up at the stars where you shine your light I have seen how you make the darkness hide in Every time it reminds me of who you are You're my maker, creator My father and my friend You're the alpha, omega Beginning and the end You're my savior, sustainer My anchor in the storm Lord, you're all of this and more I've seen beautiful mornings When the sun rose up in the sky Over hills that remind me Of the place where Christ had died I've felt tears turn to joy, pain into peace I've seen miracles happen I couldn't believe But every time it reminds me of who you are Oh, you're my maker, creator My father and my friend You're the Alpha, Omega My Savior, Sustainer My anchor in the storm Lord, you're all of this and more Oh, you're all of this and more You are faithful, you are able you are with me through it all You are higher, you are greater You are always in control You are near, you are here Even when I cannot see You are good, oh so good God, you are so good to me Cause you're my maker, creator my father and my friend You're the Alpha, Omega Beginning and the end You're my Savior, Sustainer My anchor in the storm Lord, you're all of this You're all of this Lord, you're all of this And more Walking slave to sin, but no 
about being born again I need you Oh God, I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under and baptize I need you Oh God, I need you It's your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day family and friends. Welcome to worship. My name is Paul Dean. I serve as pastor at Resurrection. It's my great honor and joy. As we gather uh, wherever we are, uh, whether it is on Sunday morning or during the week, we come knowing that we are part of a bigger community. We're part of God's family. This morning, we are going to wrap up our worship series on Job. It's called A Faith's Journey. Hopefully, your Faith has journeyed along with Job as we have moved through it. And, uh, you know, we could probably have spent another four weeks in Job. There's so much in Job that uh, we didn't get to touch. But our hope is that uh, this story has impacted us in ways that help strengthen who we are uh, as God's people. And then we're able to uh, see others uh, through the eyes of God as well. Well, we are uh, planning for some fall programming uh, this fall, our children and our youth, and our adult Bible study. Uh, We will be sending out some information about that. We want to make sure that you are comfortable. Uh, Of course, we'll follow every uh, health and safety guideline uh, that we that's recommended to us, and uh, we'll also have uh, everything online as well. Uh, throughout this fall and coming winter. And we just want you to give us feedback. If you have questions about what's going on, um, if you have things that you're concerned about, uh, please don't sit with those. Please let us know what those are so we can connect. We're also moving to form some life groups. So in this, uh, uh, on our screens during our announcements, uh, there's a screen connecting you to Sarah Storvik. You can find her email on our website as well. If you're interested in a small group or a life group that will be starting this fall, we encourage you uh, to check that out as well. Well, we are gathered to worship, so let us begin our time in prayer. 
O Lord, our God, you are awesome and mighty. And as we've been following the story of Job and how you connect into that story, we are in awe. We stand in awe of you. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts, that you would speak to our spirits, that we would know more about who you are and who we are. We ask all of this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Well, let us worship together. Through every battle, through every army, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my embrace. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe through every blessing, through every promise. confession and forgiveness. Let us pray. God, you are love. You created us in love and for love because you are filled with love and mercy. We can bring our confession to you. At this time, let's lift up our confessions to God. God, you know us. You have claimed us. You know that there are times that we don't do what we should. And there are times when we do the very things that we should not. Our choices and thoughts, attitudes and behaviors can be barriers to healthy relationships. Forgive us. Loving God, you reached out to us through space and time and entered our existence. In the name of Jesus Christ, because of his life, death, and resurrection, we are forgiven. Because of him, we are a new creation in Christ. Amen. Hi, everyone. We're going to continue learning about Job this week, but before we start talking about Job, I wanted to show you this picture. 
it's the vine that's been growing in my garden. A couple weeks ago, I showed you my garden and we didn't know what was gonna grow. We had a question about it. We didn't know, but we just had to wait to get our answer. And now we know, it's cucumbers. Now, we're finishing the book of Job for now. And throughout the book of Job, we've had lots of questions. Like Job went through a lot. He lost a lot of close family members. He got very, very sick. And we had questions about why is there suffering in the world and why Job, such a good person, was suffering so much. And maybe we have questions like that about our own lives or lives of people that are close to us. And sometimes those big questions maybe don't have clear answers. It's good to ask those questions and it's good to explore answers and imagine possibilities, but it's also important to, the, to remember that while we have these questions, we may not find answers or maybe the answers are something that only God knows. Let's remember that God is there with us while we are seeking our answers or while we are suffering. God is there and God is loving us and God gives us hope. God gives us hope of the goodness that is to come. And God loves you very much. In Hebrews, a book in the Bible, in the New Testament, it says in chapter 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. We hope in God and God's goodness, even though we can't always see it. And at the end of the story of Job, it says that God blessed Job. Let's think of the many ways that God has blessed you and God has blessed me. And let's give thanks to God for those blessings. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for always being with us and giving us hope. Help us to remember your love for us in all times and in all places. Thank you for your blessings and help us to bless others. In your name we pray, amen. Well, from March until mid-June during the pandemic, I was the only one in our house that was designated as the hunter-gatherer, um, the only one to venture out on shopping expeditions, and they felt like expeditions, getting the masks ready. And in those days early on, I was wearing gloves as well. You had to prepare. You had to plan ahead. However, I'm still trying to figure out if I was the best suited, the most talented, the most skillful, the most keenest eye, the ability to track down that toilet paper, or was I the least valuable, maybe the most expendable, like the canary in the coal mine? I know, I know my son and my wife, they have asthma, and that is a pre-existing condition. It puts them in a high-risk category. So can't send them out. Well, some days you're thinking maybe <laughs> just joking. And well, my daughter, she could not drive on her own. Uh, well, not legally. So that was a slight problem. But actually, probably during those early weeks, as we were all gathered together in the house, not really used to being with each other for that long period of time, um, it was probably just good to get me out of the house so the three introverts could do their whatever their introvert stuff was <laughs> that they needed to do. But however, being out and about in those early weeks and, and months really reminded me of other times in my history uh, and as our nation, as we came together, there was a sense of that we're going to lift uh, this all together. It was a collective lift. And I remember those early days after 9-11, where we all felt a sense of, of a common good, uh, that we were in this thing together, that we mourned with one another. But 
something takes over in our human condition. And just like what happened after 9-11, what happened in those early days of the pandemic, our leadership took everything political. And a virus and the response to a virus became a political football, which blew up. And any early chance of getting out ahead of it was, was lost. My sister is a nurse at Mass General in Boston, and we talked about this reality just the other day. She had uh, some nurses coming up from some southern states, uh, several, a couple, maybe a month into to the pandemic, and they really didn't understand in those parts of the country uh, how bad it really was. And my sister said to me, she wishes that everyone would have been able to spend just one minute with her in the COVID uh, wards in those hospitals to see what she saw, the absolute carnage that was there. She said if everybody saw what she saw, they'd be wearing masks and no one would claim that this was a hoax. And see, I've been told all my life that this country that I was born in, that I was raised in, was the greatest country in the world. And I love my country. But sometimes love can kind of gloss over even the most obvious of flaws. However, one of the best bits of our character in this great country of ours is this rugged individualism. It's kind of been part of our history that each one of us matters, personally matters, that we have autonomy in our person. And because of that, we have the ability to push out to the unknown, to the frontier, to do some pretty amazing things, to work hard, to make it. You tell I grew up in Texas. And that individualism is truly a gift, especially when you are confronted with a, a personal issue. My son has asthma, and he has an asthma action plan, a plan that lots of others who have asthma have as well, but his plan is individualized to him. And he's had one since he was four years old, but it took us a while to get there. After we kept rushing to the emergency room, my wife and I fighting about who would have to go into the x-ray room and hold our son and that kind of clamshell torture device as he cried and as he struggled. And after failed medication after medication, we finally met a doctor that looked at his case, not as another number, but this doctor saw Jonah. And in that seeing, it changed my son's life, literally, who's now going to go on to play college soccer. Do you know how much they have to run in soccer? Or the gift of my daughter's sixth grade math teacher who saw my daughter not just as another student, but as an individual kid who wasn't as prepared for middle school math as we all would have wanted her to be. And in seeing her individual need, he stayed after school almost every day for the entire year, helping her gain confidence, then proficiency. And in that seeing, changed her life. And math is one of her strongest subjects. And have you seen the math these kids are doing these days? What did we learn? I have no idea what they're doing. And then seeing George Floyd as an individual with that video, we can't look away. We see him as an individual crying out for his mom. The one who breathed for him while he was in the womb as he was losing his own breath. Which for so many of us, helped us finally put an individual reality to all those names that we've come to know over the decades. And when individualism brings light into so much darkness, it's truly a gift. But then we've also seen the ugly side of individualism. A family beating up a 17-year-old employee at a theme park this past week. A Sesame Street theme park in Pennsylvania because they wouldn't comply with a mandatory mask order, breaking the 17-year-old kid's jaw and putting him in the hospital. 
Sesame Street. Big Bird. Really? Did they even watch that show? Snuffleupagus? Well, we've seen the really ugly side of individualism, and the sad part is, is that we'll probably continue to see it. However, that bit of our character is only part of the whole. It's only part of the whole. Because we also realize that life is not separated or insulated. We're not just individuals, we're a community. We share things in common. And we really do need each other. Which leads us to another best bit of our character. The ability to sacrifice parts of our individualism for the greater good. And that sacrifice opens us to the best parts of ourselves. Because like that doctor and that teacher, they were able to see what was right in front of them. And for many in this nation and in the world, the issue of race is no longer hidden away either. One of the last things that Jesus says to his followers before he's taken to be tried and executed were words of encouragement. Jesus said that they were in this together with each other and with God, that in community, in relationship, they would find the path forward to love each other, not as they would love themselves, but as Jesus loves them. Not just to love themselves as an individual would love themselves, but as Jesus loved them, which means sacrificial love. That is the love of God for us. To see what was right in front of them and to give. Now, That's the gift that we saw in the story of Job last week. Job finally saw the reality of the world, the bigness of it, the vastness of it, the wildness of it. And it led him to turn, to repent, to change his mind, to be silent, to listen, and to come home. Before God spoke, Job could only see his individual self, his individual issue his individual pain. And he had molded God into his own individual God. And here's the deal. When we're suffering, an individual God, a God who sees us, is exactly what we need. That's who we cry out for. When those who suffer are are losing their breath, they cry out to the one who breathed life into them. That was Job's lament. And Job And God says to Job and his friends in Job 42, verses 7, this is what he says. After the Lord had spoken these things to Job, he said to Elphaz the Terminite, My anger is stirred up against you and your two friends, because you have not spoken about me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, another word for right is, in the Hebrew, is honest, which I think for us might be a better translation, as the word right gives us the impression that Job got the answer right, which he obviously didn't. But Job spoke honestly before God. That means Job didn't get it wrong either. Like most of us, Job just didn't speak completely didn't speak the whole part of God, which is one of the points of Job. Job is unable to speak to the whole of God. It's an impossibility to speak completely about God for human beings. We conjecture, uh, we, we throw out our theology, lots of speaking, lots of thinking, lots of really smart people that are, that are really well studied. No matter how deep they believe they are, They still do not encompass the entirety of God. And that's why God's speeches in Job are so expansive and massive, filled with awe, to show us complete how completely out of human control the universe really is. Now, I know that may seem strange for us modern thinkers, because modernity brought this whole idea that we can control everything. 
that we can solve all the issues, but we can't. God's speeches are filled with the wildness, the uncontrolledness of the universe. This is Job, starting in, ver- in chapter 20, uh, 39, and I'm taking various verses from the message as we move through some of uh, God's speeches. This is what God says. The ostrich flaps her wings futilely. All those beautiful feathers, but, un- but useless. She lays her eggs on the hard ground, leaves them there in the dirt, exposed to the weather, not caring that they might get stepped on and cracked or trampled by some wild animal. She's negligent with her young, as if they weren't even hers. She cares nothing about anything. She wasn't created very smart, that's not that's for sure. Wasn't given her share of good sense. But when she runs, Oh, how she runs, laughing, leaving horse and rider in the dust. God goes on, are you the one who gave the horse his prowess and adorned him with a shimmering mane? Will the wild buffalo condescend to serve you, volunteer to spend the night in your barn? Was it through your know-how that the hawk learned to fly, soaring effortlessly on thermal updrafts? Do you know where light comes from and where darkness lives, so you can take them by the hand and lead them home when they get lost? Look at the land beast behemoth. I created him as well as you, grazing on grass, Docile as a cow, most magnificent of all my creatures, but I still lead him around like a lamb. But you'd never want him for a pet. You'd never be able to housebreak him. Or can you pull in the sea beast Leviathan, the fly rod, and stuff him in your creel? Can you lasso him with a rope or snag him on an anchor? Even angels run for cover when he surfaces, cowering before his tail-thrashing turbulence. Suffering. Does it ever feel like tail-thrashing turbulence? So yes, what Job said about his suffering was honest, but it was woefully incomplete. And God spends his time speaking to Job trying to fill in the gaps for him, things that he is not able to see. What God says seems so wild and out of control, it seems even chaotic, but instead on Job, it has the opposite effect. For Job, it gives him the freedom to let go, to let go of trying to have all of the answers, to try let go of trying to figure it all out, to let go of his own need to be right, to let go of his own hubris. God says there are things that are simply not in our control. We can't teach the birds to fly. We would never have conceived of a bird that can't fly, but then it's faster than a horse. And God didn't even get into the puzzle of a platypus. God's talk about the wildness of the Leviathan, the untamable behemoth, describes for us the problem that we kind of run into, the problem of innocent suffering and the goodness of God. What are these creatures that even frighten the angels? So over the time of human history, The puzzle of innocent suffering and the goodness of God have been turned over and over again. Looking at every angle, looking at every piece, but still keeping all of its edges. And those edges are sharp. Nothing is easy or smooth about the question of innocent suffering and the goodness of God. 
And while much of theology and philosophy, the brightest and best minds of all of us, have continued to turn that puzzle round and round, I'd like to share some pastoral thoughts, as that was what really Job needed. Job needed a pastor to be with him. He had friends, and we thought early on that, that they would be a pastoral presence for him. But what he got was a theological and philosophical speech from each one of them. But God finally showed up with a pastoral view, which in the midst of suffering is really what we need. Because God saw Job. So most of us experience the world in a linear way. We're born, time and events transpire, and then we die. We wake up in the morning, time and events transpire, and we go to bed. We go to work, time and events transpire, and we go home. We go to school, time and events transpire, and we go home, right? A linear, A to B kind of reality. And while there is a beginning and an end to Job. Job doesn't work in that linear equation. Job's friends wanted it to work in a linear equation. Elihu wanted it to work in a, as a linear equation, but it just didn't go that way. Job works in a circular movement, almost a spiral that continues to deepen and deepen in its meaning and in its discovery of wisdom. Job had a beginning to a suffering, and he was just looking for an end, for the linear end. He wasn't looking for wisdom. He was looking for the answer, A plus B equals C, a linear equation. Job was even looking at for that so much that he even wished for death. But Job and his friends, because of the massive question of suffering and the goodness of God, kept circling and circling. And then even when God shows up, you think that God would you know, immediately take Job's pain away, A to B, we fix it, equal C, we're done. But God continues this cycle of circling ever deeper into experience. Because God is a living God. God is with us, living this out with us. And it's not a linear relationship. It's a relationship that moves in cycles and in circles. So let's circle a bit. Let's do that. Tell me which one of these Psalms are true. I want to start with part of Psalm 13. It says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. That's one piece. Now let's read Psalm 128. Happy are those who stand in awe of Yahweh, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy and it shall go well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus shall uh, the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Which one of these Psalms is true? The one that talks about the pain of life or the one that talks about the joy of life. See, in a linear world, we'd have to pick one over the other. And we'd have to leave the other behind. But as part of a cycle, part of a circular rotation of life, they're both true. As they speak to us wherever we are. Only naming one as true 
uh, is honest, right? It's an honest take, just like Job did. Job had an honest take on his experience, but it was incomplete. We need both. And in having that both, we find our third way of living in the middle of it all, in the middle of that tension that pain and giving thanks bring, lament and thanksgiving. Or how about this psalm that Jesus says on the Christ on the cross right before he dies, as outlined in Mark 15 and Matthew 27. That's how they 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 uh, tell us this part of the story. Jesus quotes Psalm 22: "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Those are his last words in right before he dies in Mark and Matthew. Honest words, to be sure, but it's incomplete. For Psalm 22 goes on to complete the circle. It says, for he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. For you come my, for, uh, from you comes my praise in the great congregation my vows I will pay before those who stand in awe of him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him. Indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to all people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. The beginning of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? To the very end of 22, saying to even those who have not even been born yet, God will deliver them. Do you feel that tension? In the midst, in the middle of it all, in the lament and in the thanksgiving, that's what helps us make sense of suffering and God's goodness. See, we aren't told to stand there and take it. I mean, even Jesus cried out in despair. But we are called to see a more complete picture of who we are in the midst of it all. Yes, God sees us as individual, the individual beings that we are. But God also sees us as a part of a much larger whole that includes both the behemoth and Leviathan. And the promise of God is true. Now, this is a word that comes out of the whirlwind in Job. The prophet Nahum puts it this way. He says, his way is, the, is in the whirlwind and storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So that's one way we encounter the goodness of God. But we also know that God comes in the sheer sound of silence, like a thin whisper to Elijah as he suffered in his cave. And yet God comes to us in the helpless babe in a manger, vulnerable, just like one of us who had to have his mom breathe for him in the womb as well. And then God comes to us as the resurrected Christ. As we suffer, calling us all daily to die and to rise again. Because your story is not over in your suffering. Suffering does not have the last word. We live with a living God, our Yahweh, that invites us into life, not a partial life that suffering only gives, but a whole life. So may you remember 
Job, in the broken places of your life. May you be persistent in your journey of faith. May you be a light to those who are despair, in despair. May you find light if you are in despair. May you speak of hope to the hopeless. And may you bind scattered lives into the livable whole. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I And brokenness and pain is all I know well, I won't be shaken well, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance in that Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not. Captive to the light I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love prayers to you this morning. God, we are thankful that you hear us, comfort us, heal us, and surround us with your grace. And this morning, we pray for your guidance as students, teachers, parents prepare for school in the fall. Draw near to them. We pray for the sick. We are reminded this morning that you draw near to the ill and that you are their comforter. We ask that you bring healing 
and peace. We pray for your peace. We are living in an uncertain times that can bring anxiety, discouragement, and frustration. Comfort our hearts, shower us with your peace, and surround us with your love. God, what a gift it is to pray together this morning and know that you hear us, respond to us, and comfort us. We pray together the prayer our Father has taught us. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us our today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and live resurrection. I've stepped into the ocean over and over again Out away from the shoreline to find you where the world ends I've looked up at the stars where you shine your light I have seen how you make the darkness hide And every time it reminds me of who you are Creator, my Father and my friend You're the Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end You're my Savior, Sustainer, my anchor in the storm Lord, you're all of this and more Where Christ had died I've felt tears turn to joy Pain into peace I've seen miracles happen I couldn't believe But every time it reminds me Of who you are Oh, you're my maker Creator My father and my friend You're the Alpha Savior, sustainer, my anchor in the storm. Lord, you're all of this and more. Oh, you're all of this and more. You are faithful, you are able, you are with. 
my father and my friend You're the Alpha, Omega Beginning and the end You're my Savior, Sustainer My anchor in the storm Lord, you're all of this You're all of this Lord, you're all of this